Hello, and welcome to Research Software Hour. Number 16. Oh, yeah. Our debugging. <laughs> and I really like the tagline. So it was debugging, we all do it, but nobody has taught us how to, mm -hmm. and how we approach it, what are some tools that we use, and how do we, yeah. especially the approach of debugging. Yes. So, yeah, where should we begin? Well, I guess we've got our list of stuff here. Yeah, I think maybe oh, let's remind again that we have this HackMD, which is uh, can be found through Twitch, which is the document where you can ask questions and also comment, give comments, comment on other people's questions. We have an icebreaker question there, and that's a good place to uh, ask questions alternatively on Twitch chat. Yes. So, yeah, what made this such a difficult se se uh, session? Debugging is always difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because maybe it sort of relates to this topic. Like, since no one has rigorously taught us, I'm sure there are books and so on on the art of debugging, but in practice, we've all sort of learned ourselves, so we have no idea how to even organize our thoughts on it. At least I didn't know. I know lots of random things, but how to explain it, I really don't know. Yeah, and I have a feeling that uh, we all three maybe invented very similar approaches mm -hmm. independently through a lot of pain, hopefully through some learning. A lot um, of failure, yeah. probably. So yes. this is... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Improving every time you debug. Yeah. And today we'll share some of these techniques and approaches. And we also have some internal notes here with lots of like bullet points and ideas. And I think what we should do then at the end is that we copy them into the into the Hackandy Hack mm -hmm. and attach them. Yeah. As kind of a script for today. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. So why is yeah. this a challenging topic to talk about? <laughs> yeah. Is it one of these I things? I don't really know where to start. No? Yeah. Are there, once I was classifying problems or things, there's things where when it goes right, everyone does the same thing, or when it goes right, everyone does different things. And when it goes wrong, does it fail in the same way for everyone or different ways for everyone? So I really don't know where to put debugging. Maybe everyone does it differently and also it goes wrong differently for everyone. Or maybe- Yeah, it probably bugs. goes wrong for, differently for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Can debugging be fun? Is it sometimes fun? Does it feel like fun sometimes? Hmm. When you found, you found it, yes. Yeah, I think I'd it's fun so. if you do it with someone. Yeah. It, it, this is something we can recommend if you can grab someone yeah. to help you. Yeah. Even to sit or, with you, it can be fun. Or I guess also if your code is structured well so that it's even debuggable. When you have yes. a giant mess that you can't even understand yourself, well, that's a... Um, <laughs> oh, someone just mess. wrote that in <laughs> HackMD, like how to keep an overview of our code that gets more and more complex. Yeah. And I think it is really Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That starts with like version control, but it also starts mm -hmm. by separating things out, which means that if I see a problem, you already have an idea in which part of the code it might be just yeah. by the separation of modules. If everything is connected to everything, then it might be difficult to locate. Yeah. Yeah, it's modular code. So if you have a, a code that is very modular, mm -hmm. it's easier to track down, which is yeah. what you were saying. Yeah. If you have so unit tests made. Yes. Should we start with the zoology of bugs? Like what are the different types of bugs? Yeah. What good. kind of bugs did you have? Yes. <laughs> How yeah. many types of bugs? <laughs> I guess some are easy, like the syntax errors. Yeah, this, this one found. I like. Either when you're compiling or 
directly running it. Um, yeah, someone nicer if it happens when you compile, right? You don't want, you don't really like when it crashes when it's running later yes. on somebody else's computer. But yes, so we have syntax errors, we have mm -hmm. runtime errors, and uh, and then among the runtime errors, there can be those that happen every time, and then there can be those that happen sometimes, like mm -hmm. you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. So almost always or always reproducible, not reproducible. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it's how or how it actually gets reproduced class classifies them the most, perhaps. Yeah. And then there's the results are wrong. Like the code is roughly doing what it's supposed to, but you've made some scientific error in it, for example. Yes. Yeah, this morning we were teaching uh, automated testing. And ironically, when we were uh, teaching test-driven development, and I think it was our defensive programming. So then we started from a test. But ironically, the test was wrong. So if we. I mean, the test oh. was right. The, the code right. was wrong. Mm -hmm. Oh, the code was wrong, right? Yeah, because we were trying to convert uh, uh, Kelvin to Celsius, and instead of removing to 170, mm -hmm. we were adding. Yeah. But then the test was oh, right. Right, right, right. And did the test find the bug then? Uh, I don't know. I haven't executed the code <laughs> <just> to be <laughs> frankly. <laughs> Yeah, but then yeah. I misunderstood because what I like the point I wanted to make is that sometimes I have already written wrong tests mm -hmm. and then uh, written code that makes the test happy, yeah. but the whole oh, yes. approach is wrong. Yeah. So the test is wrong. And this is what you mean. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. you write a wrong test, so it's passing. Yeah. And then this is wrong. Uh, yeah. So there are these Heisenbugs and Schrodinger bugs. So what are these? Yeah. That's fancy word uh, for <laughs> Richard Fawn. Yeah. I never, I didn't know about these words. So. Yeah, I don't know where I first saw them, but apparently the definition of a Heisenbug, like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, is that whenever you try to study the bug, it changes it. So earlier today, Anne had a good example about that. Yeah, you mm -hmm. just add a print statement and your code doesn't fail anymore. <laughs> So then is... you have a comment before the print statement saying, do not remove the print. And everyone is very happy. But then when you change the code and you add more functionalities, mm. and the code is moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we both knew and have seen this example. And to protect the individuals behind us, we will not say which code it is. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what, it, what it typically means is that when you see something like that, like you add a debug, you add a print statement, and suddenly the error goes away. It often means that there is a memory corruption. Yeah. There is a memory problem. Mm -hmm. And just by adding this print statement, we have moved things in memory. So suddenly things behave differently. So it's something to take seriously. Like if I see some, yeah, if yeah. I see code like that, I cannot really trust the code. Yeah, because yeah. it's most likely if you are using some variables, they may uh, have some rubbish in, in it. And you may not even mm -hmm. see it. Mm -hmm. And what was this shredding, shredding a bug? Shredding a bug? <laughs> so apparently that was defined as it never worked, but you never noticed it. Like occasionally it happens to me, I say, oh, I just found this bug. But according to this bug, the code yes. should never have even worked in the first place. And like it should never have given me right results. But apparently I've been using it and haven't noticed this. So what's going on? So is it yeah. when you are uh, uh, having a, a condition you never met before, so you never highlight uh, the bug, or? I guess, well, in my cases, it's time when the code should actually be running and producing results. It just somehow never came up. I mean, yeah. I guess it's, if I could explain it, then that would be, well, I can't. You could solve it. it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, maybe related to that, um, do you know the feeling that you start, something is broken, and you figure, like, how how come it doesn't work? Mm -hmm. And then you start digging, and then comes the aha moment, and then you ask yourself, 
how could this ever work? Mm. How could this oh, yeah, yeah, have yeah. ever worked? <laughs> yes. Uh, until now, it's it's amazing. Yeah. So maybe maybe this is this. Yeah, exactly yes. like that. Yes, mm -hmm. that's a good yes, and it happened to me too. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And then we have local bugs, and we have systematic bugs. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if this is a strict definition, but I guess some bugs you can say, oh, this is a line and this is where the problem is. But I guess some are about the whole property of the system, like how several things interact together to make something wrong. Well, any of them could be slightly adjusted that might make it go away, but there's still something a little bit fishy about the code. So, so how do to debug this one? Yeah, I guess for the systematic ones, you might have to sort of really think and rewrite a larger part in order to just make it yeah. intrinsically safer somehow. So the local one, you can identify some like unit testing. Yeah, or like, mm, mm -hmm. mm. I don't know. I guess both. Well, hmm, yeah. That's a good point. Like if you test each thing individually, but they fit together, but when they fit together, then there's a bug that's not found by unit testing and needs integration testing or something like that. Mm. So, yeah. Hmm. So we have later, we want to show some tools, but um, before we go into the tools, we, we thought it would be really good to talk about the approach to debugging. Mm -hmm. And and uh, unsuggested that last week, and I think it's very really important that we not, not only focus on tools, but how do we actually approach it mm -hmm. in our heads and on on a paper, and then yeah. then we can talk about uh, how we can prepare code for debugging, and then we can talk about debugging, and yeah. hopefully we will have time to show you also some tools mm -hmm. that we use. Yeah. So, what is your approach to debugging? Print statement. I think I would start. <laughs> to be frankly honest. <laughs> yeah. I mean, same for me. I mean, if it's a small code that I'm sort of, if it's relatively self-contained, then adding in print statements is basically what I'll always do first. I mean, I guess it depends on the what kind of uh, error you you have, no? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because sometimes you can already identify a bit where is uh, the error. But if I don't know anything, I would probably put many print statement. Mm -hmm. Try to locate the section. So, uh, do you add like every two hundred lines? You add like debug one, debug two, debug three, mm -hmm. debug four, and then <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Between the two, you add more equally spaced debugs. Yes, yeah, yeah, you do that yeah. too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, like entering this function, entering that function, returning from that function. Yeah. Yes. And this is where usually I say, but why don't I have a, I should have a debug option because then mm -hmm. I could leave them for mm -hmm. next bug. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, then that gets to the logging thing. So mm, there are actually tools that make it easy to enter logging statements, which can be selectively turned on and off depending on what you need, either on a certain module basis or per file, per program, things like that. So there usually gets some point where I have a program that gets large enough and it's in Python and I say, okay, so I've had all these print statements. I want them to mostly go away but I still need a way to see what's going on. So I convert it into using the Python logging module mm -hmm. where most of these print statements becomes debugs, but then I can also have informational messages and so on, which can be um, used. Yeah. Yeah, so this is like having a, a trace of uh, the workflow in, uh, in your code. Which I think is usually very useful. I mean, so yeah. some codes they will run three hours, but you, mm -hmm. you don't have even one print. Yeah, it's probably very efficient. But if there is a problem, you mm -hmm. don't really know where. 
and this can be also useful if, uh, I mean, one thing is to debug your own code, but uh, what if you give the code to somebody else mm. and they report a problem? So they mm. say this thing is crashing mm -hmm. and yes. now you want them to tell you, well, Where, uh, so what's yeah. going on? And then it's nice with the logging because then you can say, I don't know, crank up the logging level mm -hmm. and send me the output of it, send me the log and maybe from the log I can figure it out. Mm, yeah, very I, good points. Yeah. Yeah, like when any code gets large enough and it has all many users, then you have to really think about how to get these error messages back and make sure it's pretty complete. So good error yeah. message, not mm -hmm. always uh, error, error, error. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So be precise, uh, yeah. maybe add some messages, that's right. In some That's ways, it's thing. sort of amazing that most programs that really uh, are used actually have good error messages and can, like you're running it on the cluster and then a user has a problem and you can look at the errors and actually understand something, which like... Yes. Yeah. That's right. This is part of the quality of, uh, of mm. code or software or library. Yeah. But I also often use so print statements, I think, but I, but what we, I think, all try is to place them in strategic places. Yes. Um, also to get to, like, if you have a, like, to eliminate possibilities of errors as quickly as possible. If, mm -hmm. the, if the code, I think this works well, if the code runs for a few seconds, if the code runs for a couple of hours or three days until the problem appears, mm -hmm. then that's really annoying with the print statements because you edit, you run for three days, yeah. you realize it's in the mm -hmm. wrong place, you run it again. Mm -hmm. and then what I find really important, what I try to do is to reduce the size of the problem. So mm -hmm. make it, keep the problem, but try to like reduce the code runtime problem size so that we see the bug earlier, ideally after a few seconds or minutes. This really simplifies debugging. Mm -hmm. So do you, because for instance, what I do is uh, I create uh, some files to dump more or less the memory and then I load it and I try mm -hmm. to only extract this part uh, for, mm -hmm. to make the execution, like a restart, to make oh, the, yeah, execu yes, the execution yes. shorter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But also maybe like smaller files, you were like input files. If you have input files, try to reduce the size of uh, the input files, size mm -hmm. of the problem, number of processors. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. So ex example is if, let's say, uh, I'm debugging a code which does integration mm -hmm. and it does it in a, with very fine a very fine mesh. Then the first thing I will try is to reduce the the mesh mm, yeah. because maybe mm -hmm. like maybe the the result will be useless, like the the final number. But maybe I see the same problem, and I can focus right now. Then mm. I'm focusing only on the mm. problem, not on the yeah. like scientific result. What about when the program doesn't crash but continues actually running? And thus, there's no one particular point where an error happens. It's just wrong. Oh, you mean or the results that... are wrong? Mm -hmm. Actually, we should have added mm -hmm. that to the classifications of bugs, like runtime errors, where at one point the program says, I'm stopping, something has gone wrong, I can't continue versus yes. it continues and at the end you see something is wrong, but you can't isolate it down to a given point even. Yeah, and as a, mm -hmm. as a developer who gives the code to other people, I always prefer the one where the code is crashing because at least then people notice, <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm very scared of code happily finishing with wrong results. That's the, that's the worst. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. But sometimes uh, it, it's hard to track. I mean, what is the wrong result? If you have uh, none values, it's quite easy to see this is wrong. But if you have a result, it's like numerically wrong because 
scientifically wrong. This is harder. Yes. Yeah, exactly. It, like, what if the result is 13? Is that right, wrong? Or mm -hmm. maybe, yes. maybe the person who developed the model will immediately notice that this is wrong. Yeah. It cannot be. Yeah. And, you know, once someone told me, okay, when writing code, you always want to form some really small example case that you can run yes. and verify if it works before you make it big. And as long as you've done that, you should make it a test, which can be automatically validated. And every time I've forgotten this, I've always regretted it. So. Yes. Yeah. And that's the same way. I mean, for this kind of problem, if you have regression tests where you check mm -hmm. with the previous results, mm -hmm. every time you make a change in your code, mm -hmm. at least you don't have normally too many changes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And what about finding the point of the problem? Mm, yeah. So. Yeah, we talked about placing debug statements, but sometimes we want to find the problem in not like where in the code. I mean, we would like to know where in the code, but we also want to find out where in the history of the code. Yeah. And by knowing when in the history, then we might it might be it might help us to find where in the code because then we see the one change. And I mean, the keyboard here is by by section. Mm -hmm. So, so that's when we use version control. Yes. Yeah, without version control, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. You're lost. Yeah. 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 So and use maybe, version control. <laughs> absolutely. And maybe we have time later to show this tool called git bisect. So that's a git command, which can help us to bisect the history of a project. Yeah. Otherwise, maybe we can put the link of the example we have. No, it's... Oh, yeah, let me do that. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very nice one, if we don't have time. Yeah. We already mentioned the commenting out random parts of code just to see if it still happens. Yeah. Thank you. Kid. Yeah. Which is always great, but you better have good version control so you can revert all this later. <laughs> hmm. Another really useful thing to locate where something happens is a git grab. Because sometimes I get an error message which is not useful, mm -hmm. or it's not very informative. Or I get error like I routine, subroutine, subroutine ABC crashed. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know what the subroutine does, but uh, maybe it will help me to see where it is so that I can go in and put these print statements in. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I git grab for it. I have also, I'm also guilty that a couple of times I created myself really useless error messages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. I, which I found very funny. Only sometimes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> have you ever made an error message that just random characters on the keyboard? So if it comes up, you can grab for it just to find the line and then know where to go. Yes. Yes, I did. <laughs> OK, so let's say you've managed to find a point where the error happens. And let's say you actually have an error message. What do you do then? Read the error message. <laughs> Read the error <laughs> message. <laughs> Read the error message as opposed to sending an email saying, it doesn't work, please help, and not including the error message, of course. And this is also something that nobody taught us how to look yes. at a trace back or a backtrace mm -hmm. and how to look at an error message. Do you because the error is, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Go on. <laughs> yeah. Do we have any error backtrace that we could look at? I think we will oh. see one. Hmm. I have one I can execute. I mean, we have probably thousands of them. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. So if anybody has a recent trace back of an error, you can maybe post it into the HackMD and we can inspect it. Mm -hmm. I can uh, uh, post mine if you want, and then we can. 
Let's see yeah. if I can copy. Or is it hacking the? Because it's not so easy to find. What is the interesting part of an error message? What is the relevant part? Yeah. Yes. So let me know where there are. Me Do you see it? Yes. I'll also share the screen then. Oh, yes. Thanks. So I, maybe I can also post the code that runs it. Yeah. It's, it's only four so lines. Here we go. So yeah, when you get an error message like this, how do you approach it? So what I'll usually do is it's big and long. So I can't, I don't want to read the whole thing. So first I'll start reading from the top and the bottom and then try to decide which side helps me a little bit more. So for example, here I see the last line says attribute error, int object has no attribute replaced, but I see this happens inside of some Dask, um, Dask code, which most likely, um, most likely it's my problem, not Dask's problem. So in this case- well, You are optimistic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you less optimistic about Dask? I think this is not my problem. Yeah. <laughs> but why do you think? Why do you think it's something? So, uh, it's an error that we created. So yeah, because it's not very obvious from here. Yeah. So I, well, I see that there's an error s equals s dot replace, which looks like is code that's trying to be run on a string, but I guess this s is an integer. Yeah. So I'm wondering, have I passed in an uh, integer instead of a string? Uh, and then, so part of why I look from the top is maybe the code itself printed out some error messages before the actual traceback happened, which is always possible. Or sometimes there's multiple tracebacks, which happens um, several times. Mm. And this is some, this is like the error actually is thrown by the library that we are using. Um, sometimes you know yeah. in a traceback, I often read from the bottom. Mm -hmm. Also, also here we see that the problem is in the bottom, really. Yeah. But then I go, go step up, by step. Backward, yeah. Yeah, I go backwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm normally looking at. Is this coming from like my code, or is this coming already from the other people's code, like mm -hmm. the libraries or the yeah? If I'm using some other dependencies, yeah. So and I go, I go as far back as I still recognize that this is somehow my code, mm -hmm. and then I look at the line numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And here, this is interesting because it looks like there's none of the own code here. This is all in the other package. We see IPy parallel, IPy parallel, distributed, and then Dask. But I mean, we have quite a lot of information about the line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you go up, you, you can see where it is called. But you need okay. to make it a bit larger because you don't see the... Uh, um, if you go on the right, you will uh, see the function where it fails. Are here. Uh, yeah, on the line on, on the right. You need to scroll on the. More. This is as yeah, far. Uh, yeah, but on the, on the it's too it's too large, and I think huh. you miss the right. Yeah, on this one. Yeah, I can't go any. Yeah, more. here you are. Go on the right even more. I can't. Oh, you can't. Okay, and because you should see this become dusk. Uh here. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a function I, I'm calling. Okay, so yeah, there. Yeah. Okay, so here you go. This is something you've run, 
And I see there's an integer you've passed here. Yeah. And the error message says int object doesn't have replace. So maybe the arguments to um, n cores is wrong somehow. Yeah, in fact, that's not this one. You can, uh, if I track it down, you can and can put the rest of the. It's it's failing yeah. in in this line. You see the line uh, where it's failing uh, one thousand one hundred and sixty four in the past underscore bytes. So this is where usually uh, I will mm -hmm. go. So I know this yeah. is the become underscore dask. Yeah. Then I, if you go down, you you see it's failing in. Uh, in this path underscore bytes, mm -hmm. which is a function in this dask utils. Yeah. And this is usually where I will go. Mm -hmm. And then if I go and maybe I can pass. Oh. Can you share the yeah. screen and show us? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Share the screen. Where's my uh, one, two, yeah. This one. Okay. So this is a function where it fails here. Mm -hmm. And here I it see. says pass underscore bytes. And normally you are supposed to, to pass yeah. a string mm -hmm. with values. And then here it's uh, supposed to replace. And obviously, yeah. when we call it, uh, it's mm -hmm. not. I mean, if you look here, it, if you go up, you will yeah. see this one, which is this file. Yeah. Let's see if I do. So now we open that file. Bytes. Yeah. Okay. So here it's uh, it's calling this mm. parse byte. Um, I mean, I could check the line, but this is the right line, and mm -hmm. it's calling this task config get, and this is this di distributed scheduling bandwidth. Yeah. And if you if you run this command, it's a, it returns an integer. So I didn't mm. set it by default. It's a default value. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, this one is an integer. Ah. But yeah, it's suppose it it, so, it asks for a string. So this was actually a problem in the code itself. It's an incompatibility between different version <laughs> of uh, I parallel mm. and. Uh, yeah. And ask. But this is how you can track it down yeah. going up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what if you so find What do you do now? But yeah. I remember, so just, go ahead. remember this one case where someone had some bug and they were sort of going deeper and deeper and ended up debugging like debugging some sort of assembly code inside of the print function like printf in C in order to see what was wrong. And I sort of thought, OK, you know, most likely you're a little bit too deep here. So like the chances of there being a bug in print is sort of low. So why don't you go and find where you're first calling it? Yes. And then eventually, yes. yeah, they went up and found they were calling it with the wrong, wrong arguments. And well, C being what it was gave a obscure error message. So, but what if you find a problem really in? So in here, what should I do? Yes. Mm -hmm. what it, so it's somebody. It's the library that we are using. There is a problem. What should we do then? Yeah. Well, I guess if it's a problem with other people's code, then you have to decide how much you want to spend time on it. You could decide and say, "Oh, so I." Um. You could decide, OK, so I'll find a better solution that actually works and not deal with it. You could actually go and debug the code and get a development environment and try to fix it and send the patch back. Or you could try to understand it and then find a workaround and then use that instead. Like in this case, if it's yeah. incompatibility stuff, then you would install compatible versions somehow. Yeah. Or, yeah, but um, I, I guess I would put a, a issue first. Or I mean, I would or, notify yeah. because maybe Search maybe the uh, maybe yeah. the, it has been solved somewhere by or someone. Or even search the error message. Mm -hmm. and exactly. Maybe, I mean, maybe other people have seen it 
maybe other people have reported it, maybe there is yeah. even a solution reported. And if nothing, and if it's mm -hmm. a nice open source code, and if you want to be really nice, then we can open an issue mm -hmm. and then maybe even offer a solution. Yeah. Because I mean, the solution you uh, suggested, like to fix a bug, is uh, it mm -hmm. can be time consuming if uh, if it has already uh, been discovered and this is right. already in the pipeline and yeah. they are already working on it. So I, I think maybe first notify, yeah. and then yeah, of course, if you can offer your help, I'm sure yeah. they will be very very mm -hmm. happy. Yeah. These days, I often go to the issue tracker and search some of the error messages or related yeah. concepts. And sometimes it's at least known with workaround or maybe even solved. So yeah, like in this case, I guess searching this in either the desk or the yeah, I mean, here just issue search, tracker. If you search for this error, you will find something. So it, it, obviously, it already happened some years ago, mm -hmm. but now it, it's it's back. Um, yeah. And I, I guess this is because the uh, uh, two libraries are not uh, evolving at the same pace. So it's it's hard, for, for instance, to, to have the proper interface. Mm -hmm. I mean, this become dusk is still under development. And this is where you need probably to check, uh, is it a very stable uh, function? Is it something people are still developing? Mm -hmm. Because yeah, mm -hmm. if you search, they say this is still under development. Yeah. It's not surprising. It's mm -hmm. still saving. OK. And before we go into the tools, uh, one one really important approach, I'm not sure we mentioned it, to take a break. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to sometimes step away from the screen and go for a walk. Yes. Sometimes That's the right. solutions come when Stopping, actually stopping being in front of the screen. Sometimes I got the solution mm -hmm. by going into the supermarket. Yes. Yeah. It happened to me very often. When it, I mean, you can't stop because mm -hmm. you really want to to find it, and you you think you are very close to it, mm -hmm. and you are completely mm -hmm. obsessed trying to find <laughs> the bug. And at some point, you are exhausted, yeah. so you stop. Mm -hmm. And then the day after, you say, "What? It's yeah. obvious." <laughs> yeah. So yeah, take a break. It's a very good yes. point. I don't know. Sleeping on it. And yes. also I'll comment on on uh, Twitch to to also read the it can actually help to also read the function yes. that mm -hmm. we are using. Oh, oh that's a very good button. point. Yeah, yeah, that is quite that's true. probably the first thing we should do, actually. Mm -hmm. Very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to make sure we are using appropriate data function. Yeah. Yes, and trying to explain to what is happening maybe to somebody else, writing it down. That can already help to yeah. populate it. Yes. But still telling everyone the first thing to do when debugging is read someone else's code. Maybe it might be educational, but maybe not the most practical for everyone to do. Anyway. We have two more sections, and that is how do we prepare code for debugging, and then some debugging tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Should we talk about preparing code? Yeah, let's do yes. that. So, how do you prepare codes for debugging? Who I guess what we mean by that is to um, make it easier, right? Using debugging tools. Mm -hmm. I mean, we talk about some of them, like logging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, who remembers? Oh, yes, you had more. Yeah, sorry. Who remembers the Zen of Python? So it says, uh, what is it? Errors should never pass silently unless explicitly silenced. So even some things like not, like planning, okay, if there's ever an error, I should present it to the user as soon as possible in order to help things debug, be debugged. So for example, in Python, try except without a condition of a certain kind of error can allow the original error to pass unnoticed, and then you see something unrelated that occurs yes. in the future. So one of the principles when I'm writing code is always like try to find the errors, and if so, fail quickly. So think about like, what could be what could happen. Mm -hmm. 
and then prevent it or you, like you you throw an exception or yeah like I mean, there's always the things like check the arguments for the function. Like, for example, in this desk issue, it could have checked, okay, if the input is, is not a string, then uh, raise an error immediately instead yeah. of this other thing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. What else? Um, in debugging, we said already. Yeah. Uh, debug compile flags. So when we compile, oh, yes. for compile code, we can add specific flags. So if we then use debugging tools, or if the code is crashing, it can give us more information. So it, it can give us the line numbers. Yeah. Yes. It can even uh, check if your for instance, if you have arrays, if they are out of bounds. Yeah. It depends on the programming language, I guess. Yeah. So I might I might later show an example. Good, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah for floating point exception also, I think you have always mm -hmm. compiling compilation error that will mm -hmm. throw an exception, like division per zero or something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. There are some hints for making shell scripts. So there is a shell script mode, which is set dash E, which I'll put in the hackmd which means as soon as there is a mm. um, error in the script, immediately exit. Or the more advanced version set dash E uh, U P O I fail, which also means if you access a variable that's undefined, then fail immediately. Or if I want to debug a script set dash x will print out every line before it gets executed, which is good for verbose debugging. I guess if the code gets big enough, you can add some standard dash q and dash v options, um, which means either be more quiet so you can have some reasonable amount of messages and people can make it less if they want and dash v, which means print out all the debugging info, or even there's a convention, you add more v's to make it debug more. OK. V, v. Yeah. I never tried that one. <laughs> like some programs have multiple things like mm. I think PyTest, 1v, 2v's. Oh, OK. I didn't know oh, yeah, about yeah. PyTest, but yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, so we have 15 minutes left, more or less, uh, maybe a little bit more. Yeah. Should we look at some tools? Sure. So oh, yes. show some examples. Yes. I think oh. we have uh, maybe three examples, so each of us can show something. Yeah, OK. Uh, who should start? Isn't and, you? Or... Uh, oh, well, is it me? <laughs> the first on the, the list GDB. was yeah. the GDB. Oh, oh, OK. Yes. Okay. So maybe while Anne's getting that ready. So we've got, um, let's see, what is it? Yeah, a debugger. So what does a debugger do? So a debugger doesn't debug. Uh, and there is a quote. <laughs> and I, I tried to find the, it, I tried to try this, the citation for that quote. I like it a lot. And the quote is, debuggers, they do not remove bugs. They run your code in slow motion. Mm -hmm. Ah yes. So these are these are tools that slow down your code. You can stop it, halt it. You can go back mm -hmm. and forth, forward in time. You can look around um, yeah. at specific uh, breakpoints, but they don't remove yeah. bugs for you. <laughs> yeah, and there's a sort of standard command line interface. Maybe not that standard, but it's shared by at least the GDB, which is for C, Fortran, so on with. GNU compiler collection and PDB, which is Python command line debugger. So I can where... maybe show you this GDB. No? Okay, I'm. You've got. No, but go, go on while you are yeah. talking. Can... So you start the code under the control of the debugger, and the code does nothing. And you can tell the debugger to move one line forward at a time and execute that. And at any point, you can investigate the 
current state of the code. You can um, tell it to run until there is a error and then the debugger will stop and allow you to examine the state of the variables at that point. You so can set this is a... breakpoints, yes. which means run until you get to this line and then stop and print stuff. So this is a very small code and everyone could spot the bug without having to use a debugger. Should is it? Zoom in? Oh, can so you? Is it possible? Uh, I don't know if I can zoom in with this one. Hmm. Let me check. But if, if not, no problem. I can probably some somewhere put some settings, but uh, I, think yeah, it's I don't okay. know. Yeah. Sorry. It's, yeah, I mean it doesn't really matter at, at the end. Mm. You you get a yeah. code. It's supposed to be quite complex, yeah. and uh, well. you were told how to compile it. So this is mm. Fortran. So I'm using G mm. Fortran, oh. and you run it. Uh, and it, it, it has some values. Mm -hmm. So the code is it's very simple. It's, it's computing the ratio between two su uh, successive integers. Mm -hmm. And the first one is infinity, which is wrong, obviously. Mm -hmm. And you want to, uh, mm -hmm. to check it. So the first thing you normally, I don't know you, but I usually use a minus G option when I compile. Okay. And I, I, I usually also add some uh, some uh, compilation flags to trap exception in Fortran. I mean, it will be different in different languages. So which for here, for instance, I would put um, fail and trap any uh, invalid uh, values, overflow, underflow, division, pair zero, everything I can. And if you execute it, it will give you already some information with a line, which is much mm -hmm. more or less what we had before with the dask. OK. But if this is a long code, uh, you would see where it fails. Mm -hmm. So we see it's but line would, 23 yeah. or 15. I mean, here this is easy to, to understand. It will fail here, which is a line. But if, if the code is very long, you don't really know why the is so. Mm -hmm. And can we look at again at the backtrace? Yeah. Uh, so how do you know which line it is from looking at it? How did you know oh, that yes, it's so 23 yeah. and not 18? Because you go up to the look. That's what we said before. Yes, so this. it's like line 18 calls line 15, line yeah. 15 calls line 23, and then something bad happens. And this is where you have the error missing. Mm -hmm. So you always go from the bottom and you go up until okay. you get the error message here. So is this in the reverse order of Python? So in Python, the tracebacks, the first line is the highest or the first thing, and the last line is the most recently run code. I know I don't remember how it is in Python, but here in here <laughs> yeah. is indeed like the like the main function is on the outside, and the outside is the lowest one. So okay. it, mm -hmm. It pushes yeah. them on stack, and now it un unwinds the yeah. stack, and at the end we end up with main. Yeah. Well, so that's the opposite of how Python prints it. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yes. I okay. guess if when we're talking about reading from bottom or top, well. It depends on the that programming was a source language. Of confusion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah. So you think it's line twenty three. Yeah, but let's say this is very big code. I mean, you know, this is a division pair zero, but you don't yeah. really know where mm -hmm. it happens. So you need to track yeah. it down. So let's try to use this uh, debugging tool, which is GDB. So usually you call it with GDB and the executable. Yeah. And so you have to make sure you compile with at least minus G, because mm -hmm. otherwise you will not see uh, anything. Um, and this is usually what you see. Is, is, is it readable or, mm. or is it too tiny? I think at least it should be theoretically readable. OK. So when you run it, what do you do normally? So in Fortran, we usually uh, make a break on the main program. And the main program in Fortran is called different than in C. OK. So we usually put a breakpoint, uh, which is the main underscore underscore. 
Okay. And it will put a, a break at line eight, which is the beginning of the program. Mm -hmm. And then normally I would run it. Yeah. Okay, so you do run. Like run. Mm -hmm. And this is the beginning of the program, which is the first uh, uh, okay. loop. Yeah. And then what do you do normally? So it's uh, what uh, uh, Radovan was saying. You run the code in slow motion. Mm -hmm. So you can go to the next uh, instruction. I think it's yeah. using next. Mm -hmm. So you can really go step by step. Yeah. Uh, so which now, is uh, this slow motion. Yeah. So here is it printing the line number and then the line yes. itself. Okay, so yeah. we are line nine, and then this is an uh, instruction on line nine, and then you can do, uh, I yeah. think there is a shortcut if you do N instead. It's the same, mm -hmm. it's next. So it's looping, yeah. obviously, because it's, uh, it's going up. Can um, you have it print the value of P? So to print, uh, I don't remember, is print. I see. Maybe. Yeah. And uh, what do you want to print? Let's P? Say P. Is one. Okay. Yeah. So here is next running. Mm. So next is running the next, but it's not stepping. I think you need to step if you want to go in the. Oh, oh. no, not for a loop, because here we are looping. If remember the code itself. Yeah. Let's, okay. If I do a count, I think this is for. Yeah. And that means continue running until the until error it happens. fails. Yeah. Okay. And here yeah. I can make a print. So fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I could make a print uh, uh, e. So you print e. And print d. So I okay. could, uh, make. Yeah. Okay. So we see d is wrong, or at least. Yeah. The error comes because we're dividing by zero. Yes, and then you can even mm -hmm. make the print. So how do we find the source of this then? So can we go up and see, or can we see the rest of the lines around this area? Um, I don't remember like, how you do that. <laughs> if you run list, does it show something? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, uh, which line are we on? We're on line oh, yeah, 23. Yeah. Then. Yes, yeah. Okay. So, DE implicit none, they're defined as reals, and then it prints them. So, we yeah, need so... to see what called this function. Which was so... uh, what we were in the line 8. So, we have a loop, obviously. Yeah. So, if you go up, what do we see? Can you go um, up in the call stack? Don't remember how you do that in Does this interface. Up work. Up. Yeah. Like this. Yes. And do you see or how many? You try just try it without any arguments. You. Hmm. No. Oh. If you type up a few more times, what happens? Um, okay. I don't know if here I do a step. Yeah. T and T would say one. Mm -hmm. So we are getting a question over HackMD whether this wouldn't be easier in an IDE, for instance, Spider. Yes. Yeah. So nice that's a very good point. Uh, to, mm -hmm. to also, if we have time, we could look at Jupyter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because in and, like, uh, yeah. so here we are looking at GDB, but there is also PDB for Python, and these tools are often yeah. built, in, built in into an. Uh, and actually, IDE. there is a graphical interface for this GDB. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is, uh, I think, this GDB uh, okay. Google. Yeah. So. Because then you can like run the code and you can actually see yeah. which line you are right now. You can see it's stepping through. Yes, this is G D B. Green. So, yeah, would be something like this. I don't know if you will see. So you, this is one of the interface, but this is true. Usually, it can be quite. I want to be a C. Yeah. 
まあ、ちょっとね、見て。Do you see that? Or... Yeah. And maybe you don't see.、Uh... Do you see the interface? Yes, I see something. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, I think this is probably、uh, where you would see a bit like for、mm-hmm. Spider, the different.、Uh... Yeah. And we probably need to open the code somewhere. I don't know. I never used this、uh, interface. I just installed、yeah. it、uh, recently. I'm used to Total View, to be frankly honest. So I don't <laughs> really know this、yeah. one. But、uh, in, th- yeah. in theory, you can use that one. Yeah.、Uh, maybe I but... didn't start it with the right、uh, option. But, I... but definitely would use a, a, a graphical interface if I can. Yeah. To, to, but, to find it. I'd really like to find some way to get GDB from the command line to work because this is something I've seen. So I see people, just a comment in the HackMD, would it be easier to do this in IDE like Spider or when you see the variables and values? So that would be easier in some ways, but it assumes that you run your code from a thing like this and that Spider has sort of the full control over it, which can be true for some cases. But then also, I see people who go through great lengths to try to find a way to connect from their laptop through multiple servers to the cluster just to be able to debug something. When really all you have to do is start the debugger, run until the error, and then you can print out what you need and go up or down the call stack and find it. And this is something which I think people should be able to、um, do. It's also sort of a, necess- a necessity when making your code more modular. So, I'm not sure if this is how true this is, but my feeling is that when you're always running your code from the IDE, then you, it's not designed to be run from the command line. And that means that you're sort of stuck in with the IDE and can't make this transition、mm-hmm. to scripting all of your things. Yeah, I mean, for instance, in this example,、uh, the next、oh. uh, step would be to go back to the code.、Um, mm-hmm. you, you found where it is wrong. Yeah. And uh, uh,、mm-hmm. you need to go back、uh, where uh, and check and、uh, fix because here this、mm-hmm. is fairly easy. If you see that you divide by zero, you have to check why it is zero and maybe you need to make、yeah. a An exception if if、mm-hmm. the value is zero, you don't divide and you you、mm-hmm. give a, a, a limit like one or whatever.、Mm-hmm. So, as you as you said, rather than debugging, doesn't fix、uh, using a, a tool, doesn't fix the, the code.、Yeah. It it、uh, helps you to track and identify, but then you always、mm-hmm. need to go back, read the code, and、yeah. fix it yourself.、Mm-hmm. Do we have time to show? Some more tools, or are we out of time? I think、uh, you should show at least.、Uh... Yeah, I think we can go and show a bit more.、Um, who wants to show something next? So, maybe, so Richard, do you want to show this debug or magic, or was it the variable ins- inspector?、Uh, I can show both of them since they're both through Jupyter Lab. Oh, yes, nice. So, let's see. And how see. long will that be?、Uh, quite fast, I think. Cool. So here we go. I've run Jupyter Lab inside of,、um, well, on my computer. And first, we have a variable inspector to demonstrate, which is what someone has said、um, here. So I've installed it as an extension through the Jupyter Lab extension manager. Let's see. So, I could search and found this extension, and I clicked install and installed it. Jupyter Extensions is a matter for another day. But anyway, once it's installed, I can. Let's see, how did I do this? So, I right click and I can go down and find this open variable inspector option. And there, so I've got a different tab open. So, in Jupyter Lab, I can drag it to the side and make it. Well, put it as a sidebar, 
And now as I run things, I can see the value of the variables. Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, so, it's really nice. Um, yeah, so this is really useful. But the problem is this variable inspector is bound to the global namespace here. So what happens if I put everything in a function? So let me try that. Uh, so there. So now what's inside of the function is not part of the global namespace, and that's mm -hmm. what's being debugged here. So is this promoting modular code development by using functions? Well, not really. So let's make an error here. Uh, I'll try running it with these. So now I see the exception. And again, there's no hint of it in here. So we need to access the variables that were inside of here. So IPython has a debug magic. So this is not a property of Jupyter, but the IPython kernel running inside of Jupyter. So I run this. And this basically starts the Python debugger here. But it's a post-mortem debugger. So that means IPython has saved the exception that occurred here, including all of the different values of the variables in the different stack frames. And now I can do something about them. So here I'm inside. Uh, there's a lot of the same commands that there were in uh, GDB. So for example, L will list the code. I can print Y, print Z. And now, OK, so seems OK. Well, I can print type Z. OK, I see it's a class string in case I didn't know that. So now I can do Y plus Z and try to run that and get the error again. So OK, what about, uh, OK, well, depending on what I wanted to do here, I converted them both to strings to solve it. So when I'm done, actually before I'm done. So the other command you can use is up, and I go up the stack frame. So I can see here is where I called this function. So if I had called multiple functions to get down here, I would be typing up and down to go up, 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 and then at each look at the variables that I used to call that function and see is it roughly correct, does it make sense to figure out where the problem is. So when I'm done, I need to make sure to push Q to quit. Otherwise, this hangs the input of the debugger. What did you put? Oh. Q. Q, OK. Yeah. So this was another example of a function. So let's say there's something wrong here. Or so I know there's something wrong in this function. I would sometimes come here and do, like I just put in a raise statement, which says, well, whatever, just start the debugger there, like right? cause a problem there. So I save the file, and now I will run this, run, OK, let's restart. So now I'm running the debug test lines. And here I get an error, and it says, oh, wait. There, so I see an error message, no active exception to re-raise. Well, so this raise itself was a bug, but it lets me run the debugger there, and then print this kind of stuff, and then figure out what's wrong, which is a trick I often use. So yeah, those are two tools. So this variable inspector concept exists in many different kinds of languages. But I think there's still a need to understand the command line debugger for some cases. 
Okay. It is quite nice, actually. I yeah. never used it before. <laughs> Which one? The this uh, debug uh, one. Mm -hmm. And the present debug, you see, it ran something called IPDB here. And that's a debugger included in IPython, which is more fancy than the built-in Python debugger. So, nice. right on, would you like to demonstrate Velgrind? Yes, I'd like to. It's, it's very nice. Yes, I want to show Velgrind tool, and I'm putting the link into the HackMD. So this is a tool that I use uh, if I hit a memory problem. Mm -hmm. And we hinted on this at the beginning of the show. Should I take the screen here? Yes. Uh, find it. Hopefully it doesn't crash. <laughs> okay, I'm sh I will resize the portion here. Okay. A little bit. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm almost there. Sorry. Here. <laughs> I want to. So we have put the link to this to these examples into the into the HackMD, and I want to now debug this example code example CPP. I want to show you what's going on inside. I have put in three memory problems. One problem is a memory leak. So that is we allocate an array, but we never deallocate. Mm -hmm. So we get less and less memory available. So I don't free the memory. So that's one problem. The other problem that I will do is, is an out of bounds problem. I'm allocating an array with the length of 1,000. Mm -hmm. But now I write some number to the element uh, which is outside of bounds, out of bounds. And later I deallocate it. That's a nice uh, one because it doesn't fail. Yeah, and the, exactly, so here I'm, this is not something weird will happen. I'm writing somewhere in memory where I'm not supposed to. And then a third, a third problem in this example code is I'm using the memory after I have freed it. So I'm allocating the memory, I'm deallocating it, but then later I'm printing something. So this is, this is like a C, C++ code. And here I will print, well, I'm not sure what I'm getting. There is something in this array. Unsure. Okay, now let me. I will now go. Oh, oh yeah, and here's the tool that we that I will use to inspect it. So there are these three problems, and I want to now locate them, and I will move my tunnel in to the picture. And here I have this example. So first, let me build it. And I build it with with debug flags on because I want to see line numbers later. And let me execute it. And you will see that this code is happily running. It doesn't really crash. I get... Well, I you get even get nonsense. zero. You even yeah. get some not rubbish. Yeah. And what, what would I do if I want to see rubbish? So there are compiler flags mm. where you can initialize everything with rubbish numbers. And that can be useful. To, ide mm -hmm. to identify uh, places in the code where I'm using something undefined or something weird. But here I will use Valgrind. Valgrind with my... And Valgrind is very good for memory leaks, like the first uh, you had. Yes. Because so they are I super to... hard to track. Exactly, they are hard to load. So I will now run it, Valgrind, my code X. And it... It gives me some trace, and I will. We will look at it now in detail. But I want to. It gives me this hint. How about running it with that flag? I will get even more information because I will see this memory leak also. So by default, you don't see the memory leaks. By default, I don't. I don't get so much information mm -hmm. here. So I will run it again. And here, I want to show you three problems. Oh yeah, it takes one more. We found one more, actually. We had so two one before. Is, one is this memory leak. This is this one. So I look at it again from the bottom up. And I can see that line 38 calls line 5. And here in line 5, I allocate something which I never deallocate. Does that fit? Does that fit with what I, what I yes. promised? 
Just need to move the browser in. Line five. Line five, I allocated something which I never allocated. Then there are these two other problems on online. Okay, let's read from the bottom. Online line 34. I was reading something which is undefined really. It's invalid read. Line 34. That is correct because I was reading something which I have already allocated. And then finally, here on line 18, I am writing out of bounds. So this is an invalid write. So when I look at value grid output, I look at I look at how much memory is left at the end. Here I have a memory leak because I haven't deallocated everything. If I want to know where it is, it's here. And I normally look for invalid reads and invalid writes. And at the beginning of the show, we talked about these print statements. Sometimes they can move these around. Mm -hmm. So when I suspect a memory problem, I run it through Valgant. One maybe disadvantage of, well, one little problem with Valgant is that it runs the code a lot slower than usual. I think 50 times slower because it, mm. it emulates the whole memory. Mm. And I, I say that, so it's another motivation to make the problem small. really small and short so that I can run it through Valgant. Good, that's all I wanted to show. Yeah, but it's super nice. Very super useful tool. Yeah. Should I give the screen back? Sure. So I've been trying to make another example to use IPDD from command line that involves several different stack frames, oh, cool. but it's not quite ready yet. Okay. Well, actually, I'm trying to install. Uh, trying to figure out how to install IPDB. Um, mm -hmm. Or is it included in? Hmm. Uh, we have a question on how to approach segmentation fault. Mm -hmm. Should we, I wonder whether we have enough time to create one. <laughs> it's usually quite easy. Yeah. Can you say... make it in your bell grind example? Yes, I was wondering if, what do we see with Valgrind? Because of memory fault, we would see it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will try something and if it works, I will show it. Uh, and someone asked even describing what a seg fault is because that's a that's a good question. I guess I can try to explain that. So at least from my knowledge, it used to be that operating systems didn't isolate different processes from each other. So basically, me running Python could access the memory. Me running a C program could access memory from some other mm. program and even overwrite it or change it, which means that um, basically any program can crash the whole operating system, which is bad. So then there is the concept of memory, memory segmentation, which means the operating system prevents a program from accessing any other memory that doesn't belong to it. So I guess over time, this has gotten more and more complicated, but that's where the name came from. So if you try to access some memory, which is not allocated to your process, then you get a segmentation fault, which is by default a fatal error and will kill your program. 
and because there's just no way to recover from it. Like you don't, um, yeah. So I was just going to try to create one here, but it doesn't really, I wasn't successful creating this error, but the, how I would approach it really similarly, either, you know, either by compile flags, so that when the code crashes, it actually gives me a traceback again with uh, line numbers. I have also debugged this with Vagrant, so it will also show it and it will show where it happens. So I found a very simple example rather than for a sec fault. I don't know if you could uh, use Vagrant or... Okay. Very few lines and it does an uh, abnormal termination. I can try that. Segmentation fault, I get when I run it. All right, let's see. It's C code. Yes. So... Okay. In my oh, 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 there's boundary error. You don't get a sick fault? Or... On my machine, I get a segmentation fault. Yeah. I can show it on a screen share. Mm -hmm. uh... Okay. Here we go. So I copy paste it out of there. Okay. Uh, you have screen. I always have to let the terminal overlap a little bit, otherwise I can't click on it. So it doesn't say much, Valgrin. It, uh, so the thing it told, told me, well, actually compiled without, I should oh, compile yes. with, uh, with debug list, options. Yeah. Now, if I run it, it tells me not so much. It tells me this is the place at least. So I know which line. Mm -hmm. And then I would go in and have a look and find out why. Yeah, at least Maybe. it gives you the line. It's nice. Yeah. And then I would probably go in with printing. And if that is too little, then with GDB or with like heavier machinery. Stopping the share. Yeah. Okay. Any, anything else so, we want to show? Yeah. Um, so I can give the full uh, PDB example if you'd like. Uh, I think it would be fast. So here we go. We're back to my Jupyter lab. Um, let's see. So here's some. I modified this Python code to add several different functions, which are called there's test. There's other which calls test after doing some stuff. And then in main, there is um, some things here. So since this is embedded in several functions, um, well, this is not in IPython notebook, so I don't know if I can even run the stuff. But anyway, um, yeah, so here I am. So let's try running this. Python um, debug test.py. And I had a clever strategy I did here. There's this function s.literal eval, which will convert anything so it will basically give the same effect as entering this thing within Python. So it converts one to an int and quoted B to an integer. So let's try this. Mm. Oh, so I get a failure. Okay, 
So what do I do? My first thought is let's go to the debugger instead of printing things. So Python dash M PDB to start the Python debugger. Just running PDB from the command line would probably also work. But since I'm in a virtual environment, this will ensure that I'm using the same, the debugger with the same Python as I'm using here. So let's run it. Debugger starts and does nothing. So it's still at this line here at the top of the file. So rather than using breakpoints, I type conf first, which means continue. Actually, I can type the whole continue, which means run until there's a problem. And here I've got the exception. So we see it says type error that the same thing I saw from before and the traceback. But instead of looking at this too deeply, well, here we see there's also like main run script run. These are from inside of the debugger as it's trying to start the script. So rather than looking at this, first I type list to list the code around the area the problem was, which I think will list by default 10 lines of code around it. So let's investigate print A, print B. So I see A is a integer and B is a string. So looking up here, I don't see any clue. So uh, let's go up. So I can type up. Well, first I'll type BT for backtrace and it shows the same trace back again. So right now I'm down here. So if I push up, now I see I am in the other function, which is so I guess this must be hard to see, but I'm one, I basically one stepped up. So I'm at the point where test was called. If I do BT again, now we see there's this little cursor showing that I'm here. So I'll do list and I see the lines of code around the area. So I'll print C, print D. Okay, well there's still C and D are these things. Well, I'll go up again. So here I'm calling test. Um, hmm. Actually, why am I there? Uh, okay, well, that actually confused me because when I went up, I guess, uh, I guess this is the main function, so it doesn't really work right. But anyway, so here I could print the variables and see they're different, look at the code and figure out, oh, it's probably because I'm converting it to a string. And then I've solved it. So, so you always go back to the code at some point and yeah. check the mm -hmm. code. At least for my things. So anyway, yes. this is what I would often use to investigate values of variables that are hidden deep within different functions. And if you search for Python debugger, you can find plenty of examples of how to use it. I don't think I need to go into more detail there. So, well, now we're quite a bit over time. Is there anything more we really needed to cover? Maybe one question that came up, how do we know any, can we recommend any good memory profiling tool for Python? Mm -hmm. I think there are several of them. I was, I have used also several of them. Which one do you use? This main profile? Yeah. Mm. What else? The question was the question was about like detecting memory leaks. So I mean, one way is to actually run the profile, the memory profile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Over time, and then see that at the end it's whether it comes back to zero or not. Mm. Also to find out where most of mm -hmm. it is consumed. Yeah. Okay, well, what? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to ask what we learned today as a summarization. Or is it time for that? It's not that difficult. <laughs> yeah, like. <laughs> With simple examples. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, like these are sort of the building blocks you have in order to dig deep and see things. It's like as a scientist, if you can't measure it, then you can't 
understand it. So without the debugger and the logging and things like that, you can't measure what your code is doing. So you can't truly understand it. I would say go back to the basics at some point. I mean, <laughs> using fancy tools is yeah. nice, but sometimes we forget we need to go back and look mm -hmm. at the code, yeah. so read the code. Yeah. yeah, and what I learned today, what I really learned today is to explain to somebody else, explain mm -hmm. the problem to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And yes. just by explaining, it will become clear to you and maybe this, to somebody else yeah. has a really good suggestion on how to approach it. Mm -hmm. That's right. So debugging in groups, uh, at least with one in pair, it's usually the best approach. Yeah. I guess there's something to be said about pair programming. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Which is not very common in academia. Mm -hmm. Is it common outside of academia? Yes. Okay. At least yeah. I have seen many times. Yeah. Every time I've tried to do it, it just doesn't really work. People can't follow along long enough. They're distracted with other projects, don't have interest in working with someone else, and so on. Hmm. I, I learn a lot with pair programming. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's one of the things that I'll be talking about in the Nordic RSE conference next week. Oh, nice. So don't so. forget to join. <laughs> Yeah, we've got several more questions. One about detecting memory leaks with CUDA, which I know really oh, nothing this is about. Tricky. Um, we have to check. I don't know, honestly. I also don't know. Is this CUDA mem check? Mm -hmm. And for the other question, pair programming. So the way I've learned it is basically I have one computer, two people, one person is typing, and both people are thinking about what's being typed and implementing it. So, well, I guess it could be the person who's not typing is the one that's telling the typer what to do. So basically, you have two sets of, or two brains that are thinking about yeah, the code brains. as it's being yeah. made for every part. Not just, I think like, it's, yeah. not just say collaborating with Git where you're both programming something which gets merged together later, but um, yeah. It's very good for defensive programming or for, for designing tests mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah. Because the, the other person usually yeah. is not biased or less biased. Yeah. And you, you can mm -hmm. see bugs very quickly, yeah. like even syntax error. It's much easier if you have someone because they will say, mm -hmm. oh, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like this mob programming thing too. Mob <laughs> programming. <laughs> Basically, like Twitch programming. <laughs> and it works very well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, maybe we should wrap up for the day. Yes. So thanks to everyone for following along. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks so much for watching. And thanks, thanks you too, for teaching me your tricks here. Yes, thanks a lot for yeah. the value. I mean, I forgot. Mm -hmm. I haven't mm -hmm. used it for so many times. Yeah. And this debug uh, in Python. Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. OK. Well, thanks a lot. See you. Oh, so next week, we have a special program. So as part of the Nordic RSE conference, which I guess someone can stick into HackMD, our plan was to do a research software hour during the conference as one of the conference sessions, where I guess it would be, do you know when it is? It's Tuesday or Wednesday, most likely. But we will have, um, it'll be by, on Twitch as usual, but um, maybe so with a larger like, audience. Yeah, Wednesday, a little bit different time, 12.30. Is it CET? CET. Yeah. yeah. 
So instead of 8.30, yeah. it will replace the mm -hmm. session. Mm -hmm. OK. Well, thanks a lot. See you next week. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.